Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Anike Daptari, and I'm, uh, I work as a product manager in the Contrail Cloud Networking Group. Um, I have with me my uh, co-presenters, Stefan Capel and Michael Glis, from uh, the, the nice guys from Nice in France. Uh, they work for IBM, by the way. And the topic here is going to be um, how do we use OpenStack Heat and extend OpenStack Heat to implement or to deploy net security policies and network function service chains. Uh, I'm hoping that you have heard about uh, security policies and network function service chains, but in case you haven't, uh, I'll try and give a, a little bit of an idea of what these network function service chains are. Um, we'll keep the uh, agenda simple and easy give a quick background of uh, the products that we are talking about. Uh, I'll focus on Open Contrail, and my colleagues from IBM will talk about the IBM Cloud Orchestrator. Uh, we'll give a brief background of uh, what's the relevance of OpenStack Heat here in, in what we are talking about, uh, network function service chaining. And then uh, we'll see some use cases, and uh, then my colleagues from IBM will also help us uh, uh, see these things in action, and they'll show a demonstration of uh, Open Contrail integrated with OpenStack Heat integrated with IBM Cloud Orchestrator. And um, if we have time, uh, we'll also do some Q&A. We'll try to keep time for the Q&A. So, so a, a quick background. I leave uh, the uh, IBM Cloud Orchestrator. I leave the IBM guys to talk about the Cloud Orchestrator. They are best equipped to talk about the Cloud Orchestrator. And this is essentially in two slides what the Cloud Orchestrator enables, but my colleagues from my friends from IBM will be better equipped to talk about the Cloud Orchestrator. Now, I'll quickly talk about Contrail, and this is a, a typical solution architecture that you will see uh, when Contrail is deployed alongside OpenStack. Okay, so what's the role of o OpenStack, uh, or for that matter, IBM Cloud Orchestrator? It's, it plays the role of uh, a framework for expressing app intent. So the app developer uses IBM Cloud Orchestrator or OpenStack uh, as an interface to express what they need from the infrastructure in a simple, high-level, abstract fashion. And this uh, abstract definition of the app intent is handed to something like an SDN controller, what you see in the slide underneath the orchestrator piece. Um, the network component of the infrastructure requirements that the app developer has specified, those get handed to uh, the controller. And the controller then plays the role of a network compiler. So what do we mean by a network compiler? Um, the app developer has expressed the intent uh, in terms of a high-level abstract uh, fashion what they want from the infrastructure and particularly from the network. Uh, how could they specify this in an abstract fashion that they are deploying multiple tiers of an application and they want a network for every tier? So this is how they express the app intent in an abstract fashion. That gets handed to the controller. The controller then plays the role of a network compiler and translates this high-level abstract definition of the infrastructure requirements into more low-level constructs. Low-level constructs like routes, firewall filters, or ACLs, or routing instances, or VRFs. These are the low-level constructs that an app developer either may not be familiar with or may not want to be familiar with. So. Uh, the role of the compiler and the orchestrator is to together abstract that away, the implementation of the networking constructs away from the app, de app developer or the app deployer. And uh, the controller compiles that, spits out the low-level low constructs. And then the controller takes those low-level constructs and programs those into distributed forwarding elements. Distributed forwarding elements, we are all familiar with the Linux bridge or the open vSwitch. But in the Contrail solution, we have our own take on the distributed forwarding element. We call it the vRouter that sits in the kernel as a kernel module uh, in every x86 node in your, in your cloud data center. So that is going to be uh, where the distributed forwarding is implemented, as well as all the security policies that are specified by the app developer. In the abstract fashion, of course, they get applied and enforced in a, dis in a fully distributed manner. So the vRouter then becomes a fully distributed forwarding element and a fully distributed firewall. So that's where the security policies are also implemented. Now, we, we are going to talk about network function service chains. 
and um, the controller and the V router are jointly responsible for uh, making those service chains happen as well. And we'll see a little more about what that means. So, so that's really the responsibility of the controller and the V router. The, the good part about the solution that Contrail implements is that we are stitching uh, overlay networks, we are creating overlay networks using IP VPNs, and we are using BGP as the control plane. So that allows this solution to be uh, completely agnostic to what's running in your physical underlay. And uh, you can make changes in the overlay uh, without having to store any tenant state, whether it is tenant VLANs or tenant ACLs or tenant firewall policies. You don't have to store any of those in the physical underlay. So that's the good part of the solution. Now, um, the other good part of the solution is that it applies seamlessly across um, the, the vehicles that you use to deploy your compute workloads. So, the transition to a modern cloud data center is, is, is not, does not happen overnight. And so you have applications deployed in bare metal servers, as you can see uh, on that part of the slide, uh, on your left. And then on the right, you see some virtualized application workloads. And then you also see some containerized application workloads. So modern infrastructure tends to have compute workloads in all these three different uh, compute vehicles. So the good part about Contrail is because we are using IP VPNs, we can extend the same set of network primitives across these different compute workloads. And then on the top uh, box, you see different orchestrators. So the, because the networking primitives are ex ex exposed via REST APIs, the integration with uh, any orchestrator, whether it be Kubernetes for controllers, uh, for containers, or it be uh, OpenStack, or it be IBM Cloud Orchestrator, or it be VMware's vCenter, the integration is via the RESTful APIs. So that's the other nice part about uh, using Contrail. Now, let's quickly come to um, what an application developer is going to interface with the orchestrator. Let's say, let's look at the top half of this slide. The application developer is here trying to deploy a three-tier web application. And while deploying this three-tier web application, all the application developer knows is that um, each tier needs to be isolated from the other tier. And there are also certain policies. For example, in my three-tier web application, I have a front end that's implemented by the green virtual machines. And I want to keep the green virtual machines to talk to themselves. But in order to talk to any other tier, there should be explicit policy. What should that policy be? Now, uh, there are other tiers. There is a caching tier. That's the uh, blue virtual machines, B1, B2, B3. And then there's a database uh, virtual machines, the yellow, yellow, Y1, Y2, Y3. Now, the application developer knows that for no reason should the front end have to communicate directly with the database. All communication has to first go to uh, the caching tier. So that's one of the most important policies. So you can see there is no policy connecting the, the front end network to the back end network. But there is a policy connecting the front end network to the middle tier. And by the way, this is a web application. So the application developer knows that he only expects to see HTTP traffic. So that's the other policy that he's going, to, uh, he's going to specify. Allow only HTTP traffic between the front and the middle tier. Then this is the most interesting part. Between the middle tier and the database tier, they want to make sure that the traffic is cleaned via a virtualized firewall and then sent to the database. So before being sent to the database, I want the traffic to be cleaned by a virtualized firewall. That's all the application developer wants. And how that is implemented is completely, um, he's completely agnostic to it. So here the uh, orchestrator and the Nova component comes into the picture, where the application virtual machines, the uh, G1, G2, G3, B1, B2, B3, Y1, Y2, Y3, where they are deployed is the decision um, Nova takes based on the algorithms that are running within Nova. And uh, the firewall also happens to be a virtualized firewall. So where the firewall VMs are going to be launched is also a decision that NOAA is going to take. So it's going to run some algorithm, and available compute is going to be chosen to launch the firewall VMs as well. Now, this happens to be an example with a virtualized firewall. But you could have some other network functions, like you could have a load balancer. And maybe you have uh, a physical load balancer racked somewhere in your data center. The problem with these um, 
modern cloud uh, data centers is how do you how do you steer traffic to a sequence of services? Often in web applications, you have a number of services back to back. For example, you could have a, a sequence that says, I want to send traffic through a load balancer, and then through a firewall, and then through a van acceleration, and then on to out to the van. So that's an example sequence of uh, services that I may want to specify. And these, uh, and these may be physical network functions, or they may be virtualized network functions. And they could be launched anywhere. They could be racked anywhere in your data center. How do you actually make sure traffic is stitched across these different network functions, which may be launched anywhere in your data center, which may even be launched in uh, your service provider's data center, or they may be launched in a, in a different data center. How do you actually make sure traffic is stitched across these uh, multiple, multiple network functions in the order that the application developer has specified? That's where uh, something like an open contrail controller comes into the picture, programs the necessary next hops, that if the source is a, a blue virtual machine, if the traffic is coming from blue and destined towards a yellow VM, the, the next hop is actually the virtualized firewall. So, so that programming of the next hops is taken care by the controller, and it is programmed into the vRouter, the, the forwarding element, that makes sure that the traffic will follow the path that is specified by the application developer in an abstract fashion. Okay? So, so that is what we call service chaining. And like I mentioned, I'll quickly uh, recap that again. Uh, service chaining is not confined to one service. You could have multiple services. You could have both physical and virtual, uh, virtualized network functions in a sequence. Um, and uh, they could even, you are not even confined to a particular data center. You are not confined to a particular vendor of that network function. So all these uh, uh, different permutations and combinations are possible. And it's the joint responsibility of the controller and the vRouter to make that sequence uh, happen, make the traffic follow that path of services. So let's take an example of some uh, traffic that violates the policy. It gets blocked right at the vRouter in the host. So that's a uh, fully distributed firewall um, acting at the host level. And then uh, when you take traffic that has to actually traverse the service chain, because the next hops have been programmed in the vRouters, um, the, the vRouter will make sure the traffic originating from the blue virtual machine B2 destined towards the yellow virtual machine Y3 is first sent to the firewall and then sent to its ultimate destination. So this is uh, service chaining. Now, this, by the way, if you're familiar with uh, OpenStack Neutron, you'll realize that it's not possible with the stock Neutron. So that's the value that Open Contrail has provided. What we have done is we have, pro we have not only implemented the APIs that the Neutron specifies, but we've also gone ahead and extended uh, the Neutron API specification. So we have a whole set of new APIs that implement functionality like this, network function service chains. And uh, we've provided the implementation for those um, for these network function service chains, to implement these network function service chains. An ability for you to specify what the service sh chain should look like, and then actually instantiate that. So, so that's what um, Contrail does. It extends the Neutron API spec. But you may ask, what about OpenStack Heat? What, what, what's it got to do with OpenStack Heat? Now, let's quickly talk about OpenStack Heat. OpenStack Heat, uh, this is OpenStack Summit. It needs no introduction. Everyone here is familiar with OpenStack Heat. But it's basically uh, just another abstraction framework that allows us to express uh, entire application stacks. So in the previous slide, I was trying to deploy a three-tier web application with a virtualized firewall. So that was my entire application stack. And Heat provides me a mechanism to express that entire application stack and then uh, and then using these heat templates, I, I, I describe that. And when I run that stack, uh, the entire, all the components of the application get deployed. But the, but the important part is that of service chaining. With stock OpenStack heat from the top of the tree, uh, you, you won't be able to deploy these network function service chains that I described in the earlier slide. So, so that's where we come in again. Uh, because we extended the Neutron API specification, uh, and we wanted our customers to be able to uh, do the same using OpenStack Heat, we also went ahead and extended OpenStack Heat. So essentially, all we've done is 
uh, we've introduced some new heat resources that map to the, the new constructs that we have introduced. So they are virtual networks, um, security, I mean, uh, service templates that allow you to specify a template of the service you're trying to deploy, and then an actual instance of that template called a service instance. So these are the APIs that um, we have extended on the Neutron side, and we created corresponding resources within Heat. So this is what it looks like. You have the uh, Heat engine, and underneath the Heat engine, you have the Heat templates. But you have uh, the built-in Heat resources that you get from uh, OpenStack. And then you see on, on the center, you see the Heat plugin that we have written, that Juniper Contrail has implemented. And within the heat resources, you'll see the uh, heat resources corresponding to the Neutron extensions that uh, Contrail has added, uh, namely network policy, the ability to attach a policy, and then the ability to create a service template and actually deploy a service based on that template. So, so that's really the value we have added, and that's really what we are here to talk about, and then also demonstrate that. How this is made possible? It's by virtue of the APIs. So uh, like I mentioned, the integration with any orchestrator happens via northbound APIs. We have APIs on config, operational, and analytics. And um, this is what it looks like. So at the top, you see an orchestration application. Heat is an example of an orchestration application. And the way Heat would integrate, or the way we would implement the new resources for the Neutron extensions that we have added is by invoking the corresponding VNC APIs that are not part of the uh, standard OpenStack Neutron uh, APIs, API set. Um, so that's how the integration is made possible. What about use cases? So uh, we understood the concept of service chaining, but where do you use service chaining? Where do you see it in action? Let's take a simple example. Again, the top half here shows the logical picture. And let's say I'm a distributed enterprise with multiple branch locations sitting across uh, an L3 VPN. Uh, and um, some of my uh, enterprise um, employees are trying to access the internet. But I, as the administrator of this uh, enterprise, I'm trying to define a policy that says all traffic that's going to the internet definitely needs to be sent via a firewall and then uh, some deep packet inspection engine. So I happen to be leveraging my service provider, uh, their service provider's data center, and I've launched the, uh, these network functions in the SP's data center. And so I want traffic originating from my enterprise location that's destined to the internet to be sent via a sequence of those services running in my service provider's data center. So you, the, the, the logical picture that you see on the top is how you express your intent, uh, and the, the picture on the bottom is how that actually manifests in the physical world. And, and what you see here is an example of the service, service chaining. Uh, Similarly, if uh, one enterprise location across the L3VPN is trying to communicate with another enterprise location, and again, you want to send traffic that's crossing the L3VPN uh, to be sent through a sequence of services, the services may be running in a service provider's data center, you make that happen by specifying the top half in the abstract fashion, and the bottom half is how it manifests. Um, here's another example. Let's say an enterprise has uh, different branch locations, but they also have their own data center. And let's say they are running some internal uh, web application, some intranet application that's running in their data center. And I want to send traffic that's trying to access the, uh, the web portal through a load balancer and a firewall. So that's, again, uh, how I express the intent and how it manifests. So that's essentially all I wanted to talk about. Uh, I'll hand, uh, at this point, um, the baton to my, my friends from IBM. And what, what they'll try to show you is, using IBM's cloud orchestrator, how do you, um, how do you deploy these network function service chains that you saw here? Um, so at this point, I'd like to invite Stefan. So hello to you all, and uh, thank you, Aniket, for the great presentation you have made. Uh, my name is Stefan Capel. I work for the IBM Client Innovation Center in uh, Nice, in France. 
So now it's time for me to present you a live demonstration, I hope, because I just lost my Wi-Fi connection, uh, regarding the use of heat templates in a complete or flexible IT provisioning orchestration workflow. So please take a few seconds to write down my email or uh, our new Twitter. This is my agenda. First, I will sp present the IBM Client Innovation Center. That is a new um, IBM GTS initiative to uh, support top technology IT deployments. Then I will briefly explain uh, our vision regarding IT provisioning and orchestration. And it will be followed by uh, the presentation of our orchestration tool called IBM Cloud Orchestrator. And then this tool plus the control SDN solution uh, from Juniper. Uh, and I will explain how uh, they are integrated together based on each template. And to finish, I will uh, briefly describe the uh, infrastructure used for the live demo and the step-by-step -step scenario. So this first slide regarding the IBM Client Innovation Center networking services. Two centers have been uh, created in April, uh, one in Dallas in the US and one in Nice uh, in France. Focuses technologies are network function virtualization, so we will speak about NFV and VNF, uh, software defined networking, so we will speak about SDN, and um, this will also focus uh, open source platform and open source software such as OpenStack. So this slide is just to show our vision regarding IT provisioning and uh, IT orchestration. As you can see, we can divide uh, this period of time into three uh, different periods. The first one started uh, three years ago, and uh, we call it uh, the standardized period of time. It, it was the time where new open standards has emerged. So obviously OpenStack, but also uh, the notion of fabric in uh, the data center space. And in addition, uh, the, the uh, tunneling mechanism like uh, VXLAN or MPLS over GRE. So based on these open, open standards, we are now able to deploy an end-to-end -end solution by selecting the best of build uh, technology. Then the second period, it's called the industrialization uh, provisioning period. Basically, if we adopt SDN, we can provision and manage all uh, network devices from a centralized point, that is the SDN controller. But we still need to operate and manage the SDN controller manually. So if we want to gain benefits uh, here and reduce, and reduce sorry, time to market, we need to uh, have an orchestrator on top of uh, these products. That will be an industrializing uh, provisioning tool that will orchestrate, that will uh, provision the comp all the components for us so that we can avoid any uh, configura um, co configuration, manual intervention, maybe not all the time, but for repetitive tasks, we, uh, we will use an orchestrator to play a sort of a kind of a music partition somehow. And then, the last period of time is the automate period. So we will speak about cloud automation. How we can automate the IT provisioning or even the change management system. To achieve this, for instance, we can combine our orchestrator and a real-time monitoring system. Basically, a real-time monitoring system monitors an IT infrastructure, and then when an, al an alarm is received or a threshold is raised, there is an alert action. This alert action can be a pop-up window or maybe um, a text messages or a, an email to inform the administrator or the end user of an outage. The announcement here is that the real-time monitoring system will provide an alert action, and this alert action will trigger the orchestrator, and the orchestrator will adapt dynamically the IT infrastructure. So, to resume, 
we cannot uh, automize everything. But sometimes, they are, because sometimes they are too, too technical, too complex uh, to be uh, automated. But if we focus on repetitive tasks without any added technical value, this is here a real benefit of the use of an acrostator. So now, I will uh, go a uh, little more in detail on our uh, IBM Cloud Orchestrator tool. It is, it is really an important piece in the scope here because it is located on top of our partners' uh, networking solution, so on top of SDN controllers and VNF solution. So thanks uh, to an OpenStack native support, ICO, IBM Cloud Orchestrator, supports today multiple SDN controllers, such as today the Juniper Control SDN solution from Juniper. ICO is a multi-layer uh, orchestration tool. It means that it uh, not only focuses on the networking parts, but also the compute and the storage system, and even the business, uh, the business application uh, management and provisioning. So then we have a second layer named the workload orchestration that is more the, the pattern management. This is where we will define a workflow and then the engine, the engine sorry, of uh, IBM Cloud Orchestra will run this workflow to step-by-step -step provision the IT environment. The top layer of uh, our orchestrator is the service orchestration. So it comes with uh, the self-service portal it's like a web page to just to have access on, uh, on the tool. Uh, it could be directly um, accessible from uh, the, the application itself, or it could be integrated to an intranet. And inside this self-service uh, portal, we will retrieve the self-service catalog, so a collection of offerings. Uh, we have uh, these providers, the service provider will um, Develop for a specific client. It will allow to add an, ab an abstraction layer, as uh, Annick had said, uh, to avoid any technical parameters to enter and to focus on the service level we want to map uh, to the client. Now, two slides regarding the integration between the orchestrator and the Juniper SDN solution called Contrail. We had two we had, uh, for the story, two different ways to do it. The first was launched two years ago, or three years ago, and was based only on REST API calls integration. So basically, the ICOBU developed content pack that facilitates with predefined function to call the Juniper control, uh, controller. Now we have enhanced this, and we have a more open uh, solution based on it templates, that comes with OpenStack, so it is a common open uh, solution language or set of commands to orchestrate either OpenStack and uh, Contrail. And as is ICO is based on OpenStack and as Contrail is based on OpenStack 2, it's really uh, easy to integrate them with native commands from OpenStack. So we will see this today. And compared to other solutions, we don't have this really transparency based on OpenStack between ICO and other SDN controller from other vendor. Usually, we, need, we really need to uh, use REST API integration to get all the features supported by the controller to be exposed to the orchestrator level. And here, with the use of it templates, we have 100% of control features supported via it. This is a really valuable uh, differentiator. And when we talk about DevOps, or we can facilitate DevOps using open standard solution like OpenStack. Here we can really address business application deployment down to infrastructure deployment in the same workflow using the same ETH language. And this, uh, this slide, just to understand how it is integrated. So on top, we have our orchestrator, ICO, and then Contrail provides what we call the Contrail resource plugin. Um, 
that is included in the heat, uh, heat engine of OpenStack. When the heat engine receives um, heat templates, heat commands, it uh, analyzes all the commands. And as you can see on the right, some are um, typical uh, OpenStack co commands, so uh, like in the yellow circle. And so they are directly managed by the heat engine itself. Some are control-based uh, commands, so uh, like you have shown on the blue uh, circle. And then the heat engine will uh, redirect uh, these commands to the control resource plugin. And then the, the control resource plugin will contact the appropriate uh, function in the control SDN solution. So that we only need heat to make it working with without any other type of integration between the orchestrator and Contrail. So now I will present you the live demo uh, scenario. So at the left, we have a client premises. It could be also a branch office, uh, a physical, a legacy uh, environment connected to a pop router. Uh, at T0, we will see that um, no service sees has been provisioned, so from the client side, we have no access to internet, and also we have no access to a collection of services, like voice services, etc. What we can do is we will connect to the ICO web service portal. Here we simulate an operator from a service provider, but we can also, uh, if the service provider wants to delegate the service to the end user, he can delegate it to the end uh, client administrator, for example, and uh, then he will connect uh, on a dedicated web service portal in which it will retrieve, sorry, in which it will retrieve its uh, self-service catalog and the specific and uh, designed uh, offering um, developed by the service provider. So, you just have to open the, the portal, then click on uh, some boxes and press the launch button. And when it, it will uh, press the launch button, the uh, following uh, complete IT architecture will be provisioned. So ICO will contact OpenStack, will contact uh, Contrail to provision this uh, entire IT um, infrastructure and uh, VNF so represented in the blue square. So first, it will um, request the provisioning of three um, virtual networks. So private virtual networks, a public virtual networks, and then a DMZ virtual network. It, it is just an example of, of what we can do. Uh, not, a, not a limitation, but uh, just an example. And then on the private virtual network will be hosted uh, some services, some VNF, like the uh, Wi-Fi controller, uh, SIP uh, services, so voice services, and uh, also a virtual desktop service. And then it will be connected to uh, the a firewall to secure the traffic, uh, which is uh, the VSRX firewall from Juniper. The same for the public network. It will be connected to the uh, to internet through uh, a, a public virtual router. And in uh, blue dashed line, you can see overlays. Uh, so overlays are created from the internet pop router to the public virtual router to uh, enable the client to get access to internet. And on the other side, uh, the private uh, virtual router will be connected to the uh, client pop router in a dedicated uh, virtual CP. So dedicated for this client. So now I hope I have the internet connection to show you uh, this in real. <laughs> I have no more. Excuse me. Could you? Could you come with a credential? No, I am not connecting to Wi-Fi. Wi yeah. 
Okay, because I asked for. Uh, the uh, open one. Is this using the whiteboard? Yeah. Not using the no. Maybe you can use it. Yes, but I asked for more, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, oh, okay. I'm connected again, so, so it's okay. Sorry. Okay. So. Mm. Right. Okay. Ah, oh, oh, nice. So what we what we can do first is uh, check our uh, client VM to uh, show you that there is no connection at all at the beginning. So I'm connecting to my VMware environment, so uh, nothing uh, um, related to OpenStack and, uh, and Contrail to simulate a client, v a client uh, laptop or uh, PC. So okay, so this is my client VM. I will open a browser on it. Oh, fuck. It will be. I change the mode. So, okay. So I will open a browser and then test if I, I can access to internet. So just doing a quick dot ibm.com and just to show you that the, the request is running and uh, nothing at all is uh, I can access to uh, nothing. So uh, in this is the same for all services we will provision. So the Wi-Fi services the SIP gateway services, firewall, and DDoS. So nothing is working at T0. Then I will show you that uh, I have my uh, OpenStack dashboard here, and there is um, there are no uh, stack already deployed. Funny. Okay, so no, no items to destroy. And then on the uh, Juniper controller dashboard, that no virtual networks are already created and etc. And so then we uh, developed a graphical view so of the underlay and the overlay on the same map, just to uh, show for the demo that the services and virtual networks will be created and will appear here in this zone. So now I will connect to uh, IBM Cloud Orchestrator dashboard and I will find in my service catalog some offers uh, I can um, select. So we have categories corresponding maybe to uh, each entities of your uh, s uh, company. So I will uh, choose 
this one, this, so deploy or destroy uh, complete uh, service chaining and uh, using it templates. The first uh, things ICO uh, is doing, it is uh, requesting from Contrail and OpenStack what uh, services, what uh, stacks, and uh, what NFV, VNF are already deployed. You can see here a resume of the map we have already deployed, so nothing is deployed at all. And here a set of checkbox of currently deployed services. Now, each, uh, each checkbox is related to uh, its template. So by checking the boxes, I will ask for ICO to request the provisioning of each component. So we, s we divide on some components. So uh, the first is the creation of basic networks. So the public and virtual network here and the private virtual network, the DMZ virtual network, the firewall services between the private and public network, which will perform uh, stateful firewalling and network address translation. The IPS services to protect our public web server from the from internet. And then voice services, Wi-Fi controller, and remote desktop. So by checking all the boxes, I am now able to deploy the complete IT infrastructure. So by clicking on deploy all, ICO will request the creation, the provisioning of all components. So we will quickly shift on the, uh, on the monitoring tool I, uh, somehow. So it will appear in a few seconds because it, it has a refresh timer of two seconds. Uh, some elements. So n here, ICO is requesting a contrail to uh, create provision the network, and then it is requesting um, OpenStack uh, also, and this is related because uh, contrail is based on OpenStack. So I think I have to refresh. So, yeah, so some task are running. Okay, sorry, some we miss it. So, but <laughs> so so here, I mean, here, I represented uh, two uh, sites. Uh, one, our uh, private cloud environment at the left. So one compute node is uh, um, geographically uh, based in Nice, uh, in south of France. And uh, we have deployed on this private cloud some uh, security services, some uh, uh, services we, want, we don't want to deploy on the public environment. So uh, we'll be hosting, and it is uh, already done, the uh, GDDoS appliance, appliance and the uh, NAT instance, which is the firewall. So we keep our security products, our security zone, uh, in our private cloud. And then we deploy uh, other VNF, like uh, web server, SIP gateway, Wi-Fi controller, to uh, SoftLayer Amsterdam. So by using availability zone, we are uh, able to um, select where we want to deploy a VNF. So now, if I, if I come back to my OpenStack dashboard and just press F5, I will be able to see that all stacks I have requested, so not here. Ah, so I'm not on the, sorry. So all tasks related to each it templates uh, have been created. So you can say you can see uh, this here, and uh, as you can see here on the availability zone, uh, some are um, uh, provisioned in uh, SoftLayer Amsterdam, and some on the Nova zones, uh, which is our private cloud environment, and they are running uh, from uh, one minute or two minutes. So this is really uh, the provisioning we have just done. 
and uh, there is the same uh, uh, vision in uh, Contrail, so about uh, virtual networks. So we will uh, um, retrieve the uh, three virtual networks, private, private uh, DMZ, uh, public, plus management, of course, and uh, two other virtual networks for the uh, GDDoS appliance uh, transparency mode, so uh, two armed. And uh, now I can go back to my uh, client VM to show you that uh, I will be able to access to internet. So I'm not lucky today. I see. It seems something happened with the uh, firewall. So it is very flexible because um, we can um, add or remove some provisioning um, items or uh, VNF. So I will remove the firewall services and update the service just to relaunch the firewall again. So as you can see, firewall services are not uh, currently deployed, so I will uh, recheck the box and relaunch the um, specific uh, VNF deployments. It's so fast. Okay, so I missed a W. Nobody tell me. <laughs> okay. But it takes uh, two or three minutes for the VSRX to launch. So we can uh, maybe uh, go on the um, Wi-Fi controller now. So. And maybe log also on the VSRX, so that uh, real uh, VNF function, um, real virtual um, network function. Uh, so the VSRX is not here yet. Okay, so something. Okay, now uh, internet is working, so I will not be, uh, uh, so, oh yes, I am late. Uh, so, internet is now working, <laughs> and uh, I am able to log in uh, into the uh, VSRX, so performing um, stateful file warning and not address transition, and also the GDDoS instances. So just here, and uh, if I move uh, f to the right, uh, I have access now to my uh, public web server. So if I press F5 uh, several times to generate some traffic, uh, we will be able to see that in the GDDoS appliance, we are uh, in real time inspecting the traffic coming from the uh, client VM to uh, the public web server. So yes, so uh, this is my uh, native uh, uh, public address from the VSRX and this is the uh, IP address of the uh, 
public web server. So this is a real use case, uh, working with, uh, with uh, some difficulties, but it's working. And uh, we have provisioned this entire uh, IT infrastructure in one or two minutes. So we have uh, up to, okay, we have two class. So thanks to you all. For and uh, if you have some question, please uh, come with, uh, come to me. To uh, I will answer uh, this question uh, after. Okay. So thank you.